Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and today we're going to talk about anxiety, which is something that every child and every adult experiences sometimes. That's especially true right now with everything we've been dealing with over the past couple of years. And while anxiety and even anxiety disorders are becoming more common, it's also something that is often misunderstood. People typically think of anxiety as being a mental problem in their head, but the reality is that anxiety is a whole body situation. And when we ignore the physiology, we're missing out on an important piece that we really need to understand and address. There are so many ways to support anxiety reduction and treatment that go beyond the traditional recommendations of just counseling or medication. I have become convinced over the years based on research and what I see in my practice that a holistic approach to anxiety is the most appropriate and effective for the majority of people. And we're in luck because the amazing Dr. Ellen Vora is on the show today to help us understand how we should be thinking about anxiety and holistic ways to approach it for ourselves as well as for our children. So let me tell you a bit about her. She received her BA from Yale University and attended Columbia University Medical School. She's a board certified psychiatrist, medical acupuncturist, and yoga teacher. Dr. Vora takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalance at the root rather than reflexively prescribing medication. In addition to her private practice and speaking engagements, Dr. Vora consults for healthcare startups and has a book called The Anatomy of Anxiety coming out in March, which we're going to get to talk with her about today. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Nicole, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So I want to start with sort of going back in time because I'm always interested to understand people's stories in terms of how it brought that, them to do the work that they do today. So I'm curious for you to share with us what got you on the path of psychiatry and then more recently, what got you on the path of the holistic psychiatry and sort of out of the box psychiatry that you practice today? Sure, two separate pathways. Psychiatry, you know, I was really tortured by the decision of which specialty to choose. And someone could have saved me a lot of trouble if they just told me early on that if you were a humanities major as an undergraduate, there was a decent chance you were going to like psychiatry. <laughs> And I mean, it's, it's interesting how like I was an English major and I lived for the gray areas and the complexities of the human condition. And someone who's into that is not always going to be all that jazzed about, say, nephrology or dermatology. <laughs> so it, it should have been obvious to me. It wasn't. It took me years to figure it out. Um, the holistic approach, I'm, you know, it, among so many of us who take the holistic approach that really the way we came to that was through our own health journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting when every once in a while you'll encounter someone that's like, oh, you're just doing a holistic approach because it's trendy or maybe, you know, to make money or something. It's like, no, 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 no. It's like nobody gets here without a really personal connection to it and a, and a pretty heartfelt passion about that this is a better way to approach health. Mm -hmm. That was certainly true for me. And when I was a med student, my health could not have been, I, I think that was truly the, the least healthy time in my life, even though I was ostensibly learning how to keep other people well mm -hmm. and learning about the workings of the human body. And I thought, you know, I'm doing everything quote unquote right. I'm eating my skinless chicken breast and my low fat dairy and I'm, you know, running. <laughs> and that felt like, you know, this, I'm a model of health, but I had polycystic ovary syndrome. I was getting migraines. I had all these different autoimmune factors showing up in my blood work. Um, I had joint pain and acne and, you know, perhaps what caused the most suffering of all was that my mood wasn't good. I couldn't have clear thoughts. I couldn't really focus. I didn't feel all that calm or optimistic about life. And um, it, I felt like a machine where the screws were popping out. So after many unsatisfying encounters with conventional docs where it was like, oh, you're just stressed. Oh, you're just depressed. Oh, it's just this. Oh, you know what? Let's just put you on the pill and then you'll get your period back. And I had I didn't have the vocabulary for it yet. I didn't understand the concept of functional medicine, but I at least had this little inkling that um, maybe the pill was going to give me my period back, but wasn't that not going to fix the underlying problem? And should I ever decide to go off the pill, problem is still there. No further progress towards solving it. 
And so I, I had a little suspicion that this wasn't really the path, but it took me probably about 10 inefficient years of, of figuring out how do I get my body well. And that happened in tandem with figuring out how do I help my patients thrive. And it was somewhat disenchanting what I was learning and then applying and feeling like, okay, I've become incredibly skilled at putting people on a cocktail of medication, but I'm not convinced that I'm seeing my patients thrive or lead fulfilling lives. And so these really were parallel processes where I figured out how do I get and keep myself well and how do I help my patients truly achieve their goals. Mm. Beautifully said. And I think you're right that so many of us in um, this field can, can relate to that. Um, conventionally trained and then realized at some point because of personal, either personal or our children or a family member or somebody that, whoa, there's a lot I don't know and understand and, and haven't been taught here, which takes us on this, you know, other path. And then it all ends up coming back together, right? Because I know that you feel um, the same way I do, that there's a role for all of this. You know, there's no throwing the baby out with the bathwater of saying there's no role for conventional psychiatry, conventional psychology, conventional medicine. Of course there is. And also at the same time, there's a big role for all these other pieces too. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a little bit of a meta concept, but there's a role for all the different people in this conversation. Like some people are more dogmatic about it. Like it has to be holistic. You can never do meds. I think there's a role for that. We're all sort of on this Hegelian dialectic, figuring out the truth together. I'm somewhere a little bit more moderate where I do prescribe medication. I've seen it help my patients. Um, to me, it's, it just is not the only tool. And if somebody doesn't want to be on medication or if they've been on it in the past and it wasn't helpful, or for some reason they're having side effects or a contraindication, or they need to taper off, then I step in and say, there's still reason for hope. There are other tools. There's other things we can do to get you well. And there's this other subtle aspect of medication, which is that so often I think of mental health as it, from a very functional medicine perspective of it is a, a symptom. It's not the diagnosis. It's not the end of the inquiry. The mental health issues are a symptom of something else, some underlying state of imbalance. So I'm always just curious for the sake of, it's like a compulsive need to do this elegantly, I want to know what is the underlying state of imbalance. And I want to identify that and address that. And then often once someone's back into a state of balance, it becomes very, you know, it, it puts on the debate, like, are, are they still somebody with anxiety or with depression or with bipolar even? Mm -hmm. And so then the medication is no longer necessary. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I feel the same way about it and have seen the same. So let's talk, let's start this conversation specifically about anxiety around just having you maybe give your take on, you know, what anxiety is, maybe the, the actual definitions, you know, that we have for that, but also um, how you have grown to conceptualize and understand of what anxiety is, because I think those things are different, right? We have our, our diagnostic uh, manual that tells us here's what anxiety is. Okay. But then we also have our understanding now after years and years of practice and delving into all of this of, okay, but what is it really? So let, let's start there. <laughs> so, I mean, the DSM or diagnostic statistical manual definition to me, it's my, my copy of the DSM is quite dusty at this point. It's uh, not too. something I'm finding <laughs> useful in my day-to-day -day practice. Um, and I think that uh, to uh, the most generous read of why it formulates anxiety with all these different categories. We have generalized anxiety disorder and OCD and panic disorder with or without agoraphobia and PTSD, so on and so forth, is um, it's, it's really, you know, the idea is always to guide management mm -hmm. and with the idea that perhaps if it's panic disorder, we might steer somebody towards cognitive behavioral therapy, or if it's generalized anxiety disorder, only if you meet criteria, then do you warrant the diagnosis and then warrant the treatment. And I think you do want to be careful about gatekeeping a diagnosis with criteria if there is any potential harm to the treatment. And so understandably, if the DSM is saying you have generalized anxiety disorder and therefore the indicated treatment would be an SSRI, you know, an antidepressant, um, that is something to gatekeep. 
I approach anxiety completely differently. And I think part of the reason I don't need any lists of criteria or any gatekeeping is that nothing that I'm recommending has potential for harm. And we can kind of uh, go a little deeper into that. There's a conversation to be had around issues like orthorexia. Um, <coughs> but I think that for the most part, what I'm dealing in are interventions that are safe, they're non-invasive, they are affordable. Um, so we don't, I don't really need somebody to check six out of 10 boxes <laughs> to suggest like, let's start prioritizing an earlier bedtime. <coughs> so for me, it's a subjective diagnosis. If somebody identifies with anxiety and comes to me and says, I'm feeling anxious, to me, it's like hook, line, and sinker. Let's address this as though it were anxiety. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll identify something that somebody wasn't, you know, didn't have a subjective connection to. It's like they're coming in and they're saying, like, oh, I'm just feeling blah. And then maybe I'll say, like, well, actually, that seems like anxiety. But I'm not necessarily interested in putting words in people's mouths because we're all very suggestible. We yeah. can take on these diagnoses like an identity. Mm -hmm. And that can really impact our narrative about ourselves and our um, potential for arriving at a state of wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for kids too, I find that, you know, I work with um, children of all ages, but especially I tend to do a lot of work with older teens and young adults. And it's amazing how that identity develops from being told at a really young age, given these labels told, these are the things that are wrong with you. This is what you are and how that really impacts the trajectory of their development of sense of self and all of those things. So I agree. It's something to keep in mind, um, you know, for all of us kids and adults, for sure. One small anecdote on that. I have a six-year-old daughter and early on, long before we thought that she had any ability to really understand what we were saying, my husband and I were muttering as she was like playing in a corner by herself with her toys. We're like, she's kind of an indoor cat. <laughs> That's something we said. And she has fully owned that and incorporated it into her sense of self. So now it's like, let's go outside. She's like, no, nah, I'm an indoor cat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like, okay. Uh -huh. We've run with it. Yeah, we do. We do. We take on these labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to, to answer the second part of your question, I think if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I, the way I do formulate anxiety, to mm -hmm. me, I break it down into something called false anxiety and something called true anxiety. Mm -hmm. And false anxiety, I have learned, can be somewhat of a triggering term because it feels so invalidating. It's like, what do you, what do you mean my anxiety <laughs> is false? You know, it doesn't speak to, you know, it doesn't make the suffering any less real. Um, but it, it speaks to the underlying cause. And I really think of false anxiety as preventable or avoidable anxiety. It's the anxiety that's a result of some physical state of imbalance. Mm -hmm. And usually that's caused by seemingly pretty innocuous aspects of our daily lives. Even something as subtle as like a little blood sugar swing mm -hmm. or um, you know, exposure to blue spectrum light after sunset. And that that's impact on circadian rhythm. Um, even just drinking a little bit more coffee one day, these are the causes of false anxiety. And I like to start there first. That's the low hanging fruit. So we can just get them out of the way. These are not true to our core of our being. These are just aspects of modern life that can put our body in a stress response. And that can feel synonymous with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I like to help people just eradicate the false anxieties from their life. And then I see the remaining anxiety as something I call true anxiety or purposeful anxiety. And that's where we have this feeling of uneasiness deep within us that is really speaking to the fact that we have to pay attention to something. Something's not right in our lives, in the world around us, in our communities. And it's like our deep inner knowing is asking us to slow down and take steps to rectify what isn't right. And that's not something we'd want to um, medicate away. It's not something that's going to improve if we go gluten-free. It's just something that is true to us, but it's a call to action. Mm -hmm. I love that, that idea of a call to action that you know, our, our brain and our body send us signals of things that we need to pay attention to. And I can, I'll just speak for myself and say that my experience over the course of my life has been that my brain and body um, send louder and louder signals, the longer I try to ignore them or not deal with them until you get to a point where it's like, okay, I can't ignore this. And I need to address this now. And I think 
that's such a more helpful way of looking at it than this idea of, oh, I have X, Y, Z condition and I'm broken and this is who I am to understand it as no, this is sending me a message of what do I need to be paying attention to that I'm not? What do I need to be understanding more about myself or, or my environment? Because the big piece of this is, as you were talking about, like things going on around us in our community, in our world, it's like, yeah, there's, there's a lot that's wrong with what is around us, especially in this point in time. And, and we can have a really strong response to that anxiety being one of them. And a lot of times I say to people, you're, you're a normal human being operating in a very abnormal situation. It would be really weird if you weren't feeling anxious at this point in time. So well said. And I agree a thousand percent. I think that symptoms are really communications. Mm -hmm. And that is such an important paradigm shift because we think symptoms are a nuisance and let's figure out what's the right pill that's going to suppress it. So I don't feel that symptom anymore. But then, you know, some people describe it as like the check engine light goes on and we just put a little piece of (laughs) duct tape over it. Like, nope, no more check engine light problem solved. (laughs) It's like, well, not only is the problem not solved, but you know, you're not addressing something that needs addressing. I think, yeah, this idea, I love what you said about, you know, the check engine light, because I think that's so true, especially as adults. Um, I think that's harder with kids. Um, You know, kids often let us know pretty quickly what's going on through their behavior, through changes in, in, you know, how they're managing themselves, even, you know, changes in eating and sleep and whatever. And that can cause a lot of anxiety in parents because it's like, something's going on with my kid. I need to stop that sort of our equivalent of, I need to find the duct tape to put over that check engine light. And yet kids don't operate in that way, right? Like they, they, they are, you know, that they call us to really look at what is going on here and what needs to happen. And often for kids, as uncomfortable as this can be for us as parents and adults to lean into often for kids, they're responding to a lot of things with us in the environment and and helping them with anxiety or dealing with their anxious behaviors or whatever's going on there requires us to take a look at ourselves and how we're operating and how we've set up life around them. And that, that can be a hard thing for parents to really be willing to look at and face. It's easier to to think about it as, well, my kids got this problem. Just give me the pill or tell me the thing to do to make that go away. And almost never is it just um, isolated to something going on with the child. So true. And, you know, we have this concept of the designated patient when really it's always part of a system, an interconnected web. Mm -hmm. And I think kids like bodies are very true, clear communicators. There's not a lot of like, subterfuge or manipulation it's it's like you know when my daughter was younger and I'd be like here like have a bite of this and she turns her head to the other side like you know that is a very clear bodily way of saying no you know like adults are like "Hmm, maybe I should you know we do all this false representation of our inner truth um, because we're conditioned to throughout our lives but kids have actually been so informative for how I think about false anxiety, actually. Mm-hmm. I remember when my daughter was a newborn or an infant, we would have almost like a list on the fridge. It's like, why is she fussy right now? Because it's just a few too many things to keep in your mind in any given moment. So to refer back to that list of, oh, is she overtired? Is she hungry? Does she need a burp? Does she have a wet diaper? Is she teething? You know, and we just kind of had to be able to refer back to that list to be like, ah, we didn't think to burp her, Mm -hmm. you know, or, oh, let's, you know, maybe she is teething. And I think that with adults, we have kind of our own inventory. And actually in the book, I put a little list, just almost like as if someone's going to take scissors to their book and like cut it out and put it on the refrigerator. And it's basically like, you know, when we're in our meltdown um, or when we're feeling anxious, uh, is it that we're hungry? Are we tired? Um, are we dehydrated? Are we coming out of a rabbit hole from the phone and are we dysregulated from technology? Um, are we over caffeinated or under caffeinated? Are we due for our medication? Are we sort of in that pharmacologic nadir where our body is really waiting for its medicine? And there are several others. And so basically just to be able to refer back to that and think that's why I'm anxious. And it's not to invalidate that whatever content comes up in your thoughts when you're anxious, you know, that's meaningful, but it can take the power and the charge out of the situation to realize that 
it feels more urgent because the body is in a stress response Mm -hmm. and the body's in a stress response because we're hungry or tired and not because the world is crumbling necessarily in that moment. Yeah. The stories that we tell ourselves in our heads in those moments are certainly, um, exacerbated by whatever is going on in our body. I mean, I know that just for myself on a very practical level, I am sensitive to uh, blood sugar shifts. And if I go too long without eating or without having some protein, um, I will start to notice that the stories in my head start to shift and everything seems like a bigger deal and everything feels more stressful. And you're right to stop and go, oh, I I need to eat something. (laughs) I need to have some protein. And then it's amazing. Like, Pretty quickly after that, it's like, oh, the stories in my head just sort of settle down to a more, you know, rational, manageable level again. Um, Every yeah. Time. Every time. In my household, I have two, um, you know, my partner and my daughter are both very blood sugar fragile. And I am, you know, I, it's not nothing for me, but I'm a little bit, you know, my problems are different. Yeah. And so, but they're very blood sugar fragile. And sometimes if we just, you know, we were out, you know, didn't get a chance to eat. And then I'll just, it'll be World War III in my household. I'll just be looking at this like, oh man. And then it's like, you know, a couple spoonfuls of something and then we're all back to loving each other. (laughs) Oh, true. (laughs) It's just every single time. But, But I think it's so important and things I've learned from other episodes of your podcast, like when someone's in that blood sugar crash, Mm-hmm. It's really hard to have the presence of mind. Um, I've learned this firsthand with my partner. Certainly it's like, you know, he's sort of coming at me and I realize it's his adult version of lizard brain. Yeah. He can't think clearly in that moment that, oh, this is just a blood sugar crash. Mm-hmm. And I'm not here to invalidate the, the very meaningful content that he brings up in those moments. Like, <laughs> yes, they, you know, there are things to address, um, but we always address them more fruitfully when we're talking in a place of calm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, it's, and it's interesting how you somehow have to be a little sneaky with yourself, with others of like, how do you um, replete your blood sugar without it feeling like an attack on that very real sense of, you know, things are not right right now. Um, so, you know, to not invalidate the, the, val- the validity of the content while still addressing the underlying stress response that's exacerbating the feeling. I think so many parents find themselves in that sort of conundrum with their kids, right? The, okay, I'm sorting through what maybe is really going on here at the same time of trying to empathize and help you feel seen and heard while recognizing that really we just need to make some scrambled eggs and, you know, sit here and get you fed. And and it can be a tough balancing act. (laughs) It's like one hand is doing the back rub, eye contact on the validation, the right hand is scrambling the eggs. That's right. (laughs) Secretly in the background, yep. But I think this is such an important conversation for parents to be hearing because so often parents go to this place in their mind when their kid is having those very normal, very real, you know, moments of, oh my gosh, there's something so wrong with my kid. And so much of the work that I do, especially on this podcast is helping to normalize a lot of this, even if your child does have a clinical diagnosis normalizing this process that happens for all of us. And if we can keep our stories in check in that moment, you know, when I'm interacting with my 15 year old daughter and she is anxious and melting down about something and trying to keep the story straight in my head of, okay, she's a 15 year old girl. There's a lot going on. I wouldn't be 15 again for anything if someone asked me, you know, to go back in time and just trying to put it in context as opposed to letting those stories in those moments sort of spiral of, oh my gosh, there's something really wrong with her. She can't handle things. She's anxious, whatever, to to try to keep ourselves in that place. And so it is this this balancing act of, okay, I need to manage myself first and my stories and what's going on with me so that I can support my kid. And and that's part of what makes parenting so tough. Absolutely. And I think there is something kind of almost escapist about wanting to jump to the conclusion of you have a problem, you need help. Um, it, It is sort of like ends up being this escape hatch where it's like, so then I don't need to Mm -hmm. address how I'm showing up here, that the idea that this is a dance and that there's two of us tangoing, um, it just says like, okay, well, the problem is yours. And now we need to, um, you know, 
escalate up to professional help. And we're not saying that that's not helpful. I mean, we are therapists and I'm fully um, in support of professional help. But I also think that in that moment, it's a way of avoiding looking at what role we're playing and how we can show up differently. And, and the, the fact that sometimes this is a very healthy response mm -hmm. to a set of circumstances that are too much for our little bodies and minds to go through. Oh, so but, true. That's uh, an aspect in the in the book, actually, where I, I talk about, you know, there's this well trod metaphor of um, the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. And I do think that people who struggle with anxiety are in many ways the canaries in our modern coal mine, like that there is some subtle poisonous gas about modern life that's mm -hmm. affecting us all, but anxious folks most prominently and, and in a way that's most pronounced. And I think that with children, many times when they're struggling, it's giving us a little hint about what are these aspects of modern life that are in certain ways incompatible with thriving. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think children kind of reveal that to us. I think that's so true. And we're seeing that more and more with the number of kids who are struggling right now, particularly with anxiety. And they're saying to us nothing about what's gone on um, in the last couple of years is normal or healthy or good for any of us. And they're letting us know that with the number of, you know, kids who are struggling. And, and I want to just touch on because I think adults, as adults, we have um, sort of an experience of or an understanding of what anxiety is for us. Maybe it's, um, you know, heart palpitations, feeling, you know, kind of warm. It's maybe, um, you know, difficulty shutting off our thoughts or ruminating or having just a lot of um, feelings of stress or overwhelm or those kinds of things. And I want to just touch on um, for, for all of you as parents, um, that can absolutely be the case for kids as well. And sometimes in kids, anxiety shows up in ways that seem counterintuitive to us as adults, hyperactivity and impulsivity and sort of behavioral explosions being one of them. Most adults don't think about like anxiety being at the root of, you know, explosive behavior or impulsivity, but for kids, that is absolutely the case. And we see a lot of overlap. Even I, I see kids sometimes misdiagnosed with ADHD, really the issue is anxiety, but it's presenting like, this impulsive sort of always needing to be moving and doing something, not able to settle down um, sort of hyperactive stuff. And so I think that's, it's just something I wanted to put out there um, for parents. And I'm wondering what your thoughts or experiences are around that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and also things like stomach aches and migraines yes. or headaches. Yes. I think that um, there's a book, this makes me think of a book that I'm going to probably get the title wrong. It's either called Scattered or Distracted by yeah. Gabor Mate. Um, yes. Which, which is the right title? I think it's Distracted. Distracted. Yeah. Okay. I think I've always thought I wish it was called Scattered. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, if I'm remembering correctly, sort of the thesis of that book, it, it pertains to the fact that in, in certain ways that more ADHD presentation of anxiety, the, the common ancestor of both there is actually trauma. Mm -hmm. And that um, in certain ways, trauma creates um, a, a, a pattern of behavior where it's harder to sit still and, and be in stillness where then difficult memories come up. It's almost like a way of avoiding mm -hmm. the present moment, avoiding reality to just be always distracted. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's just another interesting view on that in, in, in a way like, yes, hyperactivity can be a manifestation of anxiety, but also hyperactivity and anxiety can be a manifestation of a different underlying cause, um, which might even just be poor oxygenation of the brain overnight during sleep. Yeah. I see this a lot. You know, I, in the adult population, I see it. And usually when I talk to them about their childhood, the kind of mouth breathing and poor sleep quality and hyperactivity during the day often starts very young. And there, you know, we'll say this is a diagnosis of ADHD, but in many ways, the inability to focus or sit still is, is a body's attempt at staying alert and awake when there wasn't adequate restful sleep. And, and that can happen very commonly these days from, from mouth breathing and poor oxygenation. And that itself has uh, as a root any number of things, including multi-generational soft foods and processed foods, which means that we're not developing healthy jaws and then we don't have a proper, properly formed airway. So we're not able to nose breathe at night. That sleep piece is so 
important for kids and adults for sure. Um, let, let's get into a bit of then what strategies and recommendations from now, like having this sort of new, um, more helpful, holistic understanding of what's actually going on with anxiety. Talk to us about some of the things that you think are really important for us to be thinking about or addressing for ourselves, um, as well as, you know, for our kids to, to support anxiety reduction or just managing anxiety better. Yeah. And it's nice that anything we do for ourselves impacts our kids beneficially. That's and right. then also it, it can be applied to our kids directly. Yeah. Um, sleep is a wonderful place to start. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can do. And a lot of us think of sleep as this black box and sort of inscrutable, hard to crack nut of like difficulty. But I actually think it's eminently treatable. And it's really just about um, being a little strategic. I apply a very ancestral perspective to sleep with the idea being your body knows how to sleep, it wants to sleep, but there are these subtle aspects of modern life that are really getting in the way of our ability to sleep. It's the central issue is the circadian rhythm. And the key here is to recognize that our circadian rhythm or our sleep-wake cycle is cued primarily by light. And that's the part that our modern environment is has deviated most of all from how we evolved. On the proverbial savanna of evolution, if it was nighttime, it was by definition dark out and light by definition meant daytime. Mm -hmm. And so we were, it's a brilliant design to be honest that if it's dark out, we suppress cortisol, our stress hormone, we release melatonin, it helps us feel sleepy and we sleep deeply. And then the sun rises and we suppress melatonin in response to the light cue and we release cortisol and we feel awake and alert. And I, a bravo to the boardroom of evolution that came up with this design. And this is just unfortunate. They didn't anticipate we were eventually going to invent the light bulb and then right. Netflix and then Tiger King. And so nobody <laughs> sleeps anymore. And so that's the problem. And we can get strategic. And it doesn't mean you have to live off the grid or away from all light pollution. It can be as straightforward as just getting a pair of blue blocking glasses and putting them on around sunset and wearing them until bedtime. Mm -hmm. There are ones that are like fully orange and that's pretty hardcore. It really is effective, but not everybody wants to see the world as orange for the last <laughs> few hours of their day. So you can get these new ones now that look almost like normal glasses. They just have a filter that blocks blue spectrum light. And that will really help our modern environment approximate our evolutionary environment in the evening. Mm -hmm. And then earlier bedtime is an interesting one. That's certainly one I found I sort of learned the hard way after having a kid where it was like, you know, if you talk to somebody who's not a parent, it's like, yeah, you get tired and then you get more tired. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn the hard way with my daughter that she gets tired and she's rubbing her eyes and she's yawning and it's adorable. And what I didn't realize is that is an emergency. And you yes. Have to whatever you're doing. And <laughs> change the diaper, swaddle, and put that pile of dynamite sticks into the crib and get out of there before it's too late. And so, you know, routinely we were letting her get overtired yeah. and then she was struggling to fall asleep and she wasn't sleeping well through the night. And we're like, God, why is this so hard? Mm -hmm. Until we realized how to really honor those sleep signs and to swoop her into bed right when she's tired. And I think it also dawned on me that adults, we are really just gigantic toddlers in many ways. And we also have overtired as a concern. Mm -hmm. And that's where our body just trying to help says, okay, you were tired one minute, you were falling asleep on the couch, but you didn't go to bed for the night at that moment. Mm -hmm. So you must have some good reason for staying up. Maybe tonight you're on night watch duty, or maybe it's the great migration. Um, so it thinks, let me help and suppress your melatonin and give you some cortisol so you can do a great job on night watch. Yeah. And, and so then we're next thing we know, we're tossing and turning and we're scrolling TikTok until midnight. Um, because our physiology really supported wakefulness once we got overtired. Mm -hmm. And so even just pushing bedtime a little bit earlier, maybe around three hours after sunset, um, and really noticing our own tired signs and swooping ourselves into our crib at that point is helpful. It, it, it's so, so true what you're saying. And I want to point out like for even, you know, elementary age kids and over, not even just our, our tiny ones, Often parents will come in with a concern about, you know, my kid gets so wound up, can't settle down for sleep. You know, it's 11 o'clock before they're in bed and sleeping. And to your point, exactly like having them look at, okay, when does that progression first start? Because if it's 
830 and your kid is wound up and bouncing off the walls, you missed something earlier that said they were already now they're way overtired. And yeah, exactly what you're describing. Now they're so overtired that now they've gone into this overdrive mode and it's almost impossible to get them to settle down. And so looking at the progression of what's happening from that after school time through dinner through the evening and and watching for the timing of that of what what's going to make more sense in terms of how is their body indicating that they're needing to settle down and maybe um you know sleep earlier watching for those things because yeah nothing's more frustrating you know with an eight-year-old than having them totally bouncing off the walls beside themselves chaotic at nine o'clock and you're trying to get them to bed and so to, to look at those pieces, I think you're so right. It's, it's, I don't make many friends with this one, but it's like, you kind of do need to create a little bit of that little house on the prairie vibe yeah. in your household toward bedtime and wow. you know, pay most attention to light. If the lights are on full blast overhead, if the TV is on in the background, if someone's looking at a screen on a phone, on a tablet, um, and especially these kinds of light that are associated with lots of things that are kind of hard hitting on our dopaminergic signaling, very rewarding, flashy, quick changing, you know, cuts, all of that is going to be so stimulating. And, um, you know, is it any wonder that so many of us and our kids struggle with sleep? Our modern environment is really destructive to our ability to kind of feel bored and sleepy in the evening. So, you know, you do kind of want to, I remember I was on an early parenting board and people were like, how do I get my kid to sleep? Here's our, you know, I was like, you know, what does it look like in the environment? And, you know, I was like, well, maybe you want to switch to a salt lamp and turn off the TV and maybe it's just candlelight during bedtime. And like, I was laughed out of that chat room. (laughs) I realize now, you know, I have to first earn credibility before I bring up salt lamps, but, (laughs) but I think that. Um, it, it is valid. And, you know, our precious little situation, not that we've perfectly um, hacked sleep, but, you know, my daughter's nightlight was a salt lamp and to keep yeah. it that more like orangey hue yeah. light and something dimmer is protective mm-hmm. of um, healthy melatonin release at night. And the impact of sleep on anxiety cannot be overstated um, when we're not sleeping well, when our kids aren't getting enough good quality restorative sleep. Um, it, it just opens the floodgates for anxiety and, and lots of other things, but anxiety in particular to be a much bigger problem the next day. And so recognizing how strong that connection is and, and how good the research is around that. Yes. And there's kind of a misunderstanding that I see around a lot where people say, well, I'm not sleeping well, but it's the depression or it's the anxiety causing the poor sleep. And that's, that's fair. You know, we can definitely have that conversation. They are such closely related concepts that it's true that if you're struggling with anxiety, maybe your thoughts are racing, you're kind of in that tossing and turning mindset as you're trying to fall asleep. And in certain ways we can identify it as the anxiety is causing the disruption to sleep. Um, But more importantly, we have to just establish in a public conversation, all mental health issues are exacerbated by lack of sleep. And so, you know, even if the anxiety can cause a sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation can cause the anxiety. And in many ways, the sleep is the easier entry point to addressing the whole vicious cycle. That's right. And, and I think that we sometimes need that why, like why does sleep matter so much? And in certain ways, I struggle to answer that like because I'll have an answer for it, but I don't think it's the whole story. I don't think we fully understand the whole story just yet. Yeah. But one correlate to think about is the glymphatic system, yeah. which is our body's ability to detoxify in our brain. We, we kind of understand maybe from high school biology, we have our lymphatic system, that series of vessels that um, gather waste from our cells and help us excrete it, whether it's through sweat or urine. Um, but we also have this system in our brain. It's called the glymphatic system because it's related to the glial cells in the brain. And that's when we basically, the, the analogy I use in my book is that our brain is like this little city and all the little shops and stores create trash during the day. And then the garbage bags are kind of piled up in the alleyways. And it's only at night while we're asleep that the glymphatic system revs up and the garbage trucks basically go around these alleyways of the brain and clear away the garbage bags. And so if we don't get adequate sleep, that process is not complete by the time we wake up and we're going through our days with alleyways full of garbage bags where we feel kind of there's gunk in our brain. We can't think as clearly. We can't stabilize our mood. We can't operate from that most fragile resource, which is executive function and being in a place of our prefrontal cortex where we can 
operate with integrity and restraint and calm ability to see things from both perspectives and you know you sort of see the evidence of that today in our kids and adults as well is like we're really not meeting each other from a prefrontal cortex place we're very reactive we're very amygdala um we're kind of operating from a brain that hasn't been fully um cleaned out at night imagine how different the world would be right now if everybody's brain effectively was able to take out the trash every night <laughs> yeah yeah on our way towards world peace. Yeah. That's right. You know, it's it's a great example. I love the visual of that. And even kids can understand that. Like what a great way to describe that to kids of why sleep is so important with the garbage and the trucks. It's great. So sleep is a big one. Talk to us quickly about what, what are some other things that we should be paying attention to for ourselves and our kids with anxiety? Yeah. So, um, so blood sugar is another big one yeah. and there's the definitive solution is to eat a blood sugar stabilizing diet, which looks kind of like well-sourced protein and carbohydrates from starchy vegetables and um, plenty of vegetables and then healthy fats liberally distributed throughout. Mm -hmm. And that can feel like a 180 degree departure from how people are currently eating. Yeah. It's like, you know, a scone at Starbucks and then nachos, or, you know, the, so if it feels too difficult, there is a little temporary hack that can you, you can use in the meantime, which is to do something like a spoonful of almond butter, or some people use ghee or coconut oil, but something to give you a safety net of blood sugar to just kind of catch you and buffer any crashes in blood sugar. And that can prevent the stress response. Um, caffeine is not a popular conversation, but I just, there's nothing inherently wrong with caffeine. It's, you know, coffee has magnesium and antioxidants and it's associated with decreased risk of Parkinson's and type two diabetes and even suicide. There's, there's merit to coffee. There are benefits. Um, green tea has antioxidants, polyphenols. It's all great stuff, but we're so with our bio individuality. Some of us are really sensitive to caffeine. And so, you know, if you know, you're the person who can have an espresso after dinner and still fall asleep, no problem. Great. More power to you. <laughs> but if you know that if you have one coffee, you are going to effectively be on cocaine for the rest of the day and you can't sleep for a week like yeah. me, then it's just worth getting honest with yourself about where's the right place to land with caffeine. And a lot of my patients with anxiety, their anxiety improves precipitously when they consume less caffeine. But PSA, you don't do that overnight. You, <laughs> you build gradually. Actually, precipitously is totally the wrong word. Um, nothing, nothing, nothing should be precipitous with caffeine change. That's right. <laughs> so, you want to go gradually. Yeah. Um, you want to wean over the course of many weeks. Yeah. Um, and then just try it out. See where you land. Yeah. Um, I think that alcohol is such an unpopular conversation, but we do need to also talk about that. Mm -hmm. I use science to sort of justify this argument, but alcohol is not doing us any favors when it comes to anxiety. And there's two main reasons. One is that it actually causes its own blood sugar crash, often overnight, which then interrupts our sleep, which then, you know, in its own right, impacts our anxiety. But then um, it rushes the brain with a neurotransmitter called GABA, mm -hmm. which is a really important neurotransmitter when it comes to anxiety. It's what helps us feel calm. It's the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of our central nervous system. But our brain sees all that GABA from alcohol, and it doesn't think, gosh, it's so nice to be relaxed. It thinks this is a risk to our survival because we're too buzzed to worry about a potential threat. And so it corrects that. It, it reclaims homeostasis by converting that GABA into a different neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And that's why we toss and turn in the second half of the night after we've been drinking, we wake up with that kind of uneasy headachey feeling. That's the glutamate conversion. So we really want to be careful with our GABA. GABA is really central to anxiety and we want to protect that resource and alcohol has the opposite effect. And I'm really glad you brought it up because, you know, like, yes, it's unpopular and I've commented on it several times and it's unpopular, especially on social media. But I think, you know, we have a lot of moms listening and this whole like mommy wine culture has become a whole thing now of, you know, day drinking or evening drinking to take the edge off, to manage, to, to settle your anxiety. And I totally understand where that's coming from. And yet... What you're describing is exactly what I see in so many of the parents that I work with, where you have a very short-term benefit for a long-term problem then, because they get trapped in this cycle 
than of thinking that they need the alcohol to settle themselves down, but it's only causing this revving up process where they're actually more anxious and destabilized and moody the next day. And, and you just end up chasing that. Um, and so I think what started out as sort of, you know, this mommy wine thing, humorous, whatever. I mean, there really are some important things to think about here for each of us to decide as individuals what role um, we want that to play in our lives and, and what are the, really the bigger picture things that we need to be thinking about. Mommy wine culture is such an important topic. And I feel like so often I'll see these sort of corporate interests taking us almost like through a lot of really big truths, but then the solution is actually something that makes the problem worse. Yes. So the truths here are that culture, the marketing is telling us like what you're doing is really hard. You know, being a parent um, is really difficult and you're exhausted and you're not getting your cup filled and you're not getting your needs met. And so, you know, we are in the background as parents nodding along. Yes, yes, yes. This is all true. Yes. You see me. I feel so seen. Yep. And then they're like, the solution is Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, okay. And that sounds good, especially because yeah. I'm already withdrawing from Chardonnay. So like, you know, right. just we'll go ahead and replete, you know, be, be the yeah. antidote to its own withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that these solutions that corporate interests interest tell us, they're usually something addictive mm -hmm. and there's something that actually exacerbates the original problem. So I'm all for everything up until that suggestion of Chardonnay is so true and something we have to slow down and pay attention to. It's very difficult to be a parent always, but I think it's especially difficult in this modern world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents are just at their wits end, not getting their needs met. This was true before we entered a pandemic <laughs> with unpredictable childcare interruptions and masking and our own anxiety and so on and so forth. And so what really we need to recognize is that we have fundamental human needs that are not being met. And can we address those? And the Chardonnay was never a true solution to that problem. And in many ways, it made the problem worse. Yeah. So, so I'm yes, so glad that we're touching on that. So we've talked about sleep, we've talked about some food and drink kinds of things. Um, what else quick here? Movement, I'm assuming movement is a piece. I talk about that all the time for kids, like getting off the couch and having physical activity. Yeah, exercise is such a big one. And I, I was recently at, um, I was in Joshua Tree, California. Oh, and it was so beautiful. And <laughs> we, it was just so funny. I was, I sat, I woke up one morning and I was meditating at the sunrise and my friend um, puts on a, a laptop, he streams some kind of exercise workout and he's like doing this workout and he felt so much better afterward. And I was thinking to myself, like this guy, he was evolutionarily hardwired to be someone who's like, I need to go hunt. Like I need to go acquire the food to provide for my tribe. And that's how he feels right. And since modern world means we just like use Instacart and order our groceries, he's not out on the hunt. And so he needs to sort of stream this guy who yells at him to like do, you know, mm -hmm. knees up high while he like marches. And so um, it's just interesting how I think exercise, um, it, it's basically trying to replace something that we are hardwired to need, which is movement. We're just hardwired to feel well when we're doing what kept us alive and well in the proverbial circumstances of evolution. So I think that we need to move because we had no, no choice, but to move, to keep ourselves fed. And now that's in our hard wiring. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's so important to me to lower people's standards. Yes. It's great. If you want to train for an ultra marathon, I won't stand in the way of that, but if you're in more of that all or nothing relationship to exercise, and it's kind of more of the nothing, then you just lower your standards. You figure out what is something that you can do for a couple of minutes. Can you put on Whitney Houston and dance in your living room? Yeah. Take a 20 minute walk after dinner. Um, just hold one plank pose for 30 seconds. Anything that creates inertia in the direction of more movement. And I think the last big category to touch upon briefly is just all things technology. Uh, yeah. And that's a toughie. And mm -hmm. It's, um, I think that, yeah, what is, what is even the solution here? I think it's just, it starts with awareness of how yeah. addictive it is. Um, it starts with a little bit of mindfulness around how do we feel before and during and after we've engaged with something and to just be as intentional and conscious and eyes wide open that we can be in how we develop relationships with our products, our technological mm -hmm. products. And I think as parents, we are present for setting the ground rules for our, our children. You know, this is setting the paradigm for their lives of how they interact with technology. 
And many of us, in a sort of a parent generation, that wasn't really part of our childhood. It just wasn't, we didn't have to establish etiquette around it. And we just have to recognize that we do. I, I always think about technology as sort of similar to, I, I heard this analogy once, um, cars without seatbelts. Yeah. So okay, we've, we've invented cars, but we haven't yet invented seatbelts. So we're just using and we're using sort of dangerously all these technological devices. And in a, in a way we have to, figure out for ourselves, what are the seatbelts? And certainly for our children, what are the seatbelts? Where are their limits? Where can we maybe have this be something that is intentional and not just the default setting all the time, which I think is impacting how we're wiring our children's brains. And it certainly creates quite a bit of, at least for my daughter, dysregulation, which then causes a lot of suffering yeah. for me, my husband certainly, but also for my daughter herself. Yeah. And so I feel like it's always on us when she gets into one of those post-technological dysregulated meltdowns, mm -hmm. like that's suffering in her that we in certain ways cause. Mm -hmm. And um, so to just be so conscious of that choices with it, it's tough though. It is tough. And I, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking that um, screen time and device use for kids has, has sort of become the equivalent of mommy wine culture for adults, right? Where we use in the short term, we think, especially, you know, if a kid is anxious or worked up or whatever, it's like, okay, this soothes them. They feel better. It's sort of that short term, but then over the longer term, what we get is sleep disruption, increased irritability, decreased movement, like all of these bigger picture problems that then just exacerbate the anxiety that we're trying to soothe by giving them a device and their app or their video game. And so it just strikes me how really the pattern is the same. It's just a different substance. <laughs> that's a great connection. I think that's absolutely true. It is kids, mommy wine culture. That's right. And I think that, um, and in both issues, it's really just humans who have some fundamental needs. That's right. And, and I think a big thing that we can do, a very actionable strategy is to um, arrive at this place for ourselves and model it for our kids, which is just being able to move through our emotions. Yeah. So often the reason we reach for wine or we reach for a screen is to numb out, is to change our state. And a lot of it pertains to this kind of emotion phobic lockdown we have with our feelings. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm biased, I'm a psychiatrist, but I say feel our feelings. Yeah. And it feels very, you know, it can feel very scary in anticipation, but just start to dabble in that you know what if you had that sensation to cry and instead of holding it back or sucking it back in you kind of just let yourself fully cry and have a big cry and we tend to think oh if I'm crying I'm in a bad place and I'm a mess I really think crying needs a rebrand and crying is very quintessentially human and healthy and it's the wisdom of our body saying we need a release right now mm. and so rather than numbing out in that moment dive into our emotions, feel them deeply. Mm. And usually that's actually what properly scratches the itch rather than just sort of numbing out to avoid feeling what we're feeling, which just kind of pushes our feelings under the rug where they're transmuted into things like, you know, abdominal migraines and for adults, chronic low back pain and chronic headaches and digestive issues. It, you know, I always say to people, it comes out one way or another. We can try to stuff it down and ignore it right now in the moment, but it's going to show up probably in a bigger way later on for kids and for us. So, yeah. 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 It, relates oh. back to, it relates back to what you were saying earlier about like your body starting at a whisper yeah. and then it builds, right. right? And it's like our body's always trying to say like, you know, you need this release. I'm like, I'm going to start gently, but yeah. if you ignore me systematically, it's going to get louder. Yeah. yeah. So true. This It's so great. Ellen, you and I could talk about this for days. I know that we need to... Um, wrap up here, but I want to make sure that people know about your new book, um, which we've given sort of a preview of uh, today in our conversation, but tell us about the book and uh, where people can get it. Yeah, thank you. The book is called The Anatomy of Anxiety, and people can buy it wherever they like to buy books. And if you ever need like a clearinghouse, my website, ellenvora.com can point you towards lots of different resources. Mm -hmm. And on Instagram, I'm at ellenvoramd. Yeah. And you have so many great resources on your website and are have such a great um, Instagram, uh, you know, as well. I um, follow you on there and just great information. And so I really encourage all of you listening, go follow Ellen on Instagram, go to her website and definitely get the book. Um, Ellen, when you told, when you said what the name of the book was, however many weeks ago, uh, I was like, that is a brilliant name for a book. I love it. 
Um, I love everything that you're doing with this. So glad you wrote a book about it. And so um, everybody should go out and get that book. And I'm going to recommend it widely at the at the clinic, too. So thank you for um, everything that you're doing in this realm. Um, it's just so important and the world needs it more now than ever. So thank you. Nicole, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you, as always, for being here and for listening. We'll catch you back here next time.